We're about to start in a minute and a half. I would like to welcome you. Thank you for being here. This is my very first DrupalCon as a speaker. It's my fourth as an attendee. Uh, I've done a lot of presentations in the past. I keep track of every single one of them. This is presentation 172 for me. But, 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 don't get it too excited. My first DrupalCon. So it took me some time and lobby work to get me in here. And today I'm going to talk about uh, using JSON Web Tokens to cache in Varnish. Uh, I'm going to do all the disclaimers now because we won't have any time when I get started. It's only a 25-minute slot. It's going to be hard for me. I babble and I ramble, and uh, someone is going to walk in here and cut me off whenever it's done. But I want to tell you that this is not the best solution out there, and a lot of people obj will object to what I have to say. But under the circumstances that I was put, it was a lifesaver. Uh, and I want to, by show of hands, who has heard of Varnish before? All right, but who hasn't? Because that's even more important. All right. Oh, don't worry. I have a slide dedicated to you and just you. And when we reach that slide, <laughs> I will look at you, OK? All right, all right. Uh, so uh, it was marked as a beginner talk, but then I contacted uh, the people from DrupalCon and asked to make it or to turn it into an intermediary talk. But they haven't changed it on the website. So people thinking that this is a beginner talk about varnish, I don't have the time to talk about varnish per se. But uh, you know what? I'm going to cut a deal with you. I'm the author of uh, Getting Started with Varnish Cash. It's an O'Reilly book that was endorsed by uh, Varnish Software. And it's a 101 book that builds up from zero to wherever you need to get. I don't have the copy on me, but I'll raffle a copy. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll give you the credentials and just tweet me. I will choose a random winner, and I'll ship you a copy of my book. All right? Sounds like a plan? Yeah. All right, let's get going. Let's press the button. Uh, the problem is I don't have a, a lapel mic, so there's no, not much walking around here. So let's... I know you can hear me all right, but it's just a matter of getting the recording in. All right. Before we start, there's a set of truths that need to be established. Should I close these doors? Yeah, let's close the doors. Thank you very much. So there's some facts that need to be established, and I'm going to need your help to make it happen. You can choose to raise your hand, shout, nod, look down at your phone. It doesn't really matter. Let's do it. Slow websites suck. Yeah. Yes, yeah. all right. Web performance is an essential part of the user experience. Slow websites are just as bad as websites that are down because in the saturated market we live in, if your website is slow or down, people just go elsewhere to buy the product and then you're screwed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhat. Drupal's cool. Yes. <laughs> the underlying technology, PHP, is cool. I'm a PHP guy at heart. I've met people here throughout the PHP scene, and I like it. But there's some trade-offs. When you put heavy load on it, it tends to crumble. It's not the fastest language out there, but it is damn flexible. And it's, it's the fastest way to get stuff done is through PHP. Now, to solve these issues, you can add, throw money at the problem and add servers at the problem. And agreed, uh, your infrastructure should, should scale along as you grow. That's a fact. That's a given. But just throwing servers at the problem is not really the idea. So we end up caching to reduce the impact of a server or of an application on the server. Still agreeing? Still with me? OK. So why would you recompute every single time if the source data hasn't changed? Incoming request to Apache or Nginx. Send it to the PHP runtime. PHP has to boot up some modules. Then Drupal gets initialized. Then you have to connect to your MySQL. See the picture? See where I'm heading? Every single time, and the data hasn't changed. A lot of people think that caching is just a way to cover up for poor architecture design, and then they'll shit on PHP and Drupal for not being as fast as other languages. But I don't agree, because caching is an essential part of your architecture. Under normal circumstances, and this one is for you, no pressure, this is the way you'll communicate. You'll directly interact with the PHP runtime that hosts your Drupal application uh, in some way, shape, or form. There might be multiple servers. There might be load balancers ahead. There might be backend servers, there might be separate MySQL servers, but you're directly interacting with the runtime. Now, by adding a touch of varnish, 
you have an intermediary system that sits right in front of your server and where both the user or the, the backend server have no real clue that there is an intermediary system. The client thinks he or she is talking to the backend, and the backend thinks that he's receiving requests from a client, where in fact it's just an intermediary and it stores computed results and just feeds them to the end user upon subsequent requests. Still with me because that's an important concept to grasp, but majority of the people raised their hands when they heard about Varnish. Now, in case you're still in doubt, in case you are still it's not looking, in case you are still in doubt. Here's a slide I often use, oops. Here's a slide I often used. Ever seen, who's seen, by show of hands, the 90s blockbuster, Bodyguard, featuring Kevin Costner, Whitney Houston, yes, thank you. Kevin, Varnish, Whitney, Drupal, right? <laughs> when in doubt, think of Kevin and Whitney. That being said, hi, welcome everyone, my name is Thais. I'm Thais Fudin on Twitter, please follow me there. I'm doing this experiment every time I speak. I add this slide and ask people to follow me and I always see this slide bump and there's an extra incentive link to it. There's, there's gonna be a prize draw afterwards. So tweet me afterwards if you like it and uh, I'll hit you up with something. Professionally, I'm a technical evangelist at a Belgian web hosting company called Combo. You might have never heard from us. Uh, we're market leader in the Benelux area. I also dedicate 50% of my time to our enterprise brand, which is called Sentia. I'm the author of Getting Started with Varnish Cash, an O'Reilly book that is endorsed by the people at Varnish Software. And that's a copy I'm gonna raffle to someone who tweets me today, tomorrow, or later. Uh, I will ship it to you when I get back to Belgium. So yeah, let's... Uh, that's me, by the way. Let's dive right in. The story starts uh, when I got contacted. I work at a hosting company by a big Belgium TV channel, uh, TV station, and they had a website to host, and we were uh, in the running to host their new website, which was written in Drupal 8. But they had this request, and they said, can you help us out with our Drupal 7 website and host it? Because it's causing us lots of pain. It's a very popular website that hosts some of the most popular uh, TV shows in Belgium and they have video content on there that they publish right after the airing of the show. So as soon as the show is aired, they upload the video, and I looked at the stats, and then up until 80,000 people uh, go to it to, to get those videos. Now, the videos is, is not really a problem. It's hosted on a CDN, uh, no real worries. But the website itself is Drupal 7 with Varnish, and I have to admit that the hit rate is pretty great. Nothing wrong there. But there's one more thing that one little business requirement that they had, and that was, hey, we're a, a TV station, we have a commercial goals, we want end users, people who watch full episodes of the program, not teaser videos or interviews, full episodes, we want them to log in using Drupal 7. I can tell you that the metal of their servers at their old hosting provider nearly melted, right? 80,000 people, Server, two, two, three servers, maybe four, perhaps. And that's because as soon as you log in in Drupal, and you know this better than I am, I'm not a pure Drupalist. I, I've been to my fair share of Drupal cons, but as soon as you log in, a session is initiated, the session cookie is set, and the cache is bypassed by design. By default in Varnish, Varnish will not cache cookies. As soon as it sees a cookie, it will just say, hey, I'm not dealing with this. I will send you to the back end, and I will bypass the entire cache. But even if you take a specialized VCL file, a varnish configuration file for Drupal, it will still bypass it because it implies that a user is logged in and is seeing user-specific content. So that's important. There is a compromise, however, uh, and they did that. Whenever those really popular shows started, they disabled the login module to prevent the servers from completely melting down and torching down the data center. So my idea was, what if we could create cache variations for logged in users. So you go to your URL, and if you're logged in, you're seeing the logged in content, in our case, the video. And if you're not logged in, you're seeing your typical Drupal login screen where we force you to log in. That's the idea. That's the mission of this talk. Now, you know as it's better than, uh, than I do that the, uh, the only information we have is that session, that ID. But all the session data is stored in the database. So we need to find a way to identify a logged in user without accessing the back end. And that last part is the trick. We don't want to access the backend for anything. And uh, I guess this is the most important slide in my presentation. The idea is to push session information from the server to the client. And we'll use JSON Web Tokens for that. And I got introduced to JSON Web Tokens in January by this guy, a really clever guy, Marco Pivetta. 
He works at Rove. He's uh, very much involved in the symphony scene. He's like figurehead there. And he talked to me at the conference I organized. I organized a PHP conference in Belgium. And he said, Taze, you need JSON Web Tokens. And I listened to the man because he's a genius. And he showed me what JSON Web Tokens look like. And this is an example of a JSON Web Token. It looks like one big blob of dew, but in fact, it's nicely composed out of three distinctive parts, color-coded in this case, separated by a dot. And all these bits and pieces are just base64 encoded JSON. Uh, the first part is the header, second part is the actual payload, the pink purplish part is the payload, and then the blue part is a signature. There is a signature involved, and it's an HMAC signature with uh, SHA-256 encryption, to make sure that the data remains untampered with, because this, is, this will be client-side stuff and we all learned throughout history that we can't trust our end users, so we need to make sure that the payload that is being sent has been signed off. And this is what it looks like. This is, this is an example of a JSON web token. The header contains an algorithm. In our case, that's HS256, meaning an HMAC sign signature using SHA-256 hashing, and that will use in the end, it also contains uh, the type JWT, then we have the actual payload, which all has, like, if you noticed it, really small names. ALG, TYP, SUB, EXP, and then all the stuff you want to add. The idea is to keep it as short as we can because all that data has to go across the wire. The more data you insert, the bigger your request is going to be, and that's not really so beneficial. So keep it short and sweet. And in the end, we're using that HMAC signature to base64 URL encode our header, do the same thing with the payload, concatenate it with a dot, do an HMAC signature, and add that secret key. The secret key is known by two parties. The issuer, in our case that will be Drupal, and the validator, in our case that will be Varnish. The end user, the client, has no clue what the signature is, and rightfully so. If you want to play around, just go to jwt.io, and you can fiddle about. They even have a Chrome extension where you could paste an uh, a JWT, and you'll see what comes out. And you can do it in the inverse way as well. You can throw in JSON, and it will turn it into a web token. And there's even a way to validate the secret key. Blah, blah, blah is an invalid signature. What we'll do here, in our case, is store it in a cookie. And that's where the objection starts. A lot of people don't like cookies for that. A lot of people think that JSON web tokens have no place in a browser-based environment. And for people in API land, they regularly use bearer authentication tokens. This is not something your browser can handle. We usually deal with basic authentication. So this is a way of, uh, of shifting server-side information to the client side. But there is an additional benefit. It is a cookie, and it's accessible by any language that has access to the browser including JavaScript. So what we can do is read stateful data without performing AJAX calls to the backend. It's there. You just have to do base64 decode, read the payload, and it's JSON. The J as in JSON is pretty identifiable by JavaScript. Uh, there was a, a custom Drupal module built for that that creates the JSON web token alongside the regular session information. Regular session cookie still remains there. And there was a hook in there that makes sure that the template reads off the JSON web token. I did not write this. This guy wrote it. Andreas de Reke was brought in by our client to replace the old agency and to just fix stuff up while they were choosing a new uh, web design agency and a new Drupal agency for their Drupal 8 site. And he did a sterling job. You can follow him on Twitter right there. And he open sourced this module right here, JWT Cookie on the GitLab. It's not GitHub this time, but GitLab. And there's a sub module in there that does some example stuff. Uh, and this is the JSON web token that he's introduced to us. The issuer, ISS, is my website. I will take this website down soon because <laughs> you might screw with my data <laughs> because it has simple passwords. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mm. This is the issuer. That's the hostname of my website. JTY is the session ID. This should match your Drupal session ID. Next up is IAT, issued at, just a Unix timestamp specifying when the session was started. And EXP, that's something we can use to determine whether or not the session has expired and we continue on. UID, that's the ID of our Drupal user, the ID from the database. Roles which is convenient because I don't want to cache admin users. I want to make sure they have 
all the preview possibilities by directly interacting with Drupal, not having a cache. So as soon as I see, uh, when I see authenticated user, I know the user is logged in. When I see administrator, I'm gonna bypass the cache. And then you have some data, the last part, which will be interpreted by JavaScript. That's all the stuff that uh, Andreas did. Meanwhile, I wrote some VCL code. And uh, the VCL code uses modules too, and it uses a VMOD, and VMOD is a varnish module, it's something you have to install on top of varnish. And it's called VMOD Digest, and it's responsible for all the HMAC stuff and all the base64 stuff. And this is where it gets tricky. Uh, we're gonna go from zero to oh my god in just a couple of seconds. <laughs> As uh, Samuel Jackson would say in Jurassic Park, hold on your butts. Let's do this. Uh, this is boilerplate code. Uh, we have to specify that it's VCL 4.0. We'll import some modules being the standard module, the variable module, the cookie module, and of course, our digest module. Now all this VCL code, when you run or reload Varnish, will compile it, not interpret it, compile it to a shared object, C++, that will be uh, attached and linked to the Varnish binary. So that, this is tremendously powerful. And the syntax looks a bit like C++ and C, but it's just a domain-specific language. And the cool thing is that these modules don't just implement C or C++, they expose an, an interface in VCL. So you basically enrich your language. Next thing we're doing is uh, generating an, an access control list with a subnet of all the internal users. They're allowed to access crons, install pages, update pages. All the others will ban. Uh, oh, we, we haven't reached the end yet. And then we have the back end. In this case, our web server is running on the same box as our varnish. In production, you might want to split that up. What have we got here? There's a lot of codes on the slide, but we'll go over the parts that are important. This is the receiving end. This is where we receive requests. And this is where we mix some of the custom stuff with the basic stuff you'll find in every other VCL file you have at Drupal. So what it does is it checks if it's a get or a post. It checks if there's an authorization header. All that kind of stuff will be dealt with. We'll only cache get or head because of item potency reasons. And because of state reasons, we don't want to cache authorization headers. And we'll be careful with the cookies. Uh, I'm not using typical regu regular expression magic for the cookies. I'm using the cookie module, and that will fetch my cookie. Normally, whenever we see a cookie, we bypass. Or whenever we see the PHP session ID cookie or the dedicated Drupal session ID cookie, we'll just bypass. But in this case, we will not do that. We'll interpret this. And uh, as you can see here, uh, we're, uh, if we go a bit lower, and I try to highlight it, the cookie, the Drupal cookie, is variable in name. So we need to find a way to fetch it first. So I'm doing some regular expression mumbo jumbo, looking for SES and then alphanumeric data. And as soon as I figured it out, I'm gonna store that name in a variable. And I will use this to filter out the cookie. So we'll remove every single cookie that we don't need. So you know, all the tracking cookies, all the Google Analytics stuff, we'll just throw that out because that will just screw with the process. And we'll keep the cookies that are important to us. In this case, PHP session ID, no cache, CI session, CI session uppercase, auth token, our JSON web token, and of course that variable session cookie. All the rest, gone. And uh, if it turns out that after removing all those cookies we don't need, that is just an empty string, we'll chop out the cookie entirely, and we'll, uh, we'll do, and this is the important part, it's in red, call JWT, and that's a custom uh, subroutine that I've written where all the validation happens, and there'll be lots of code on screen, I'm warning you, please don't have a stroke. Uh, we continue, this is all typical, uh, Drupal stuff besides the if the roles. So here we assume that we don't know nothing about JWT up until that call job JWT point. After this, we're well, we're well aware of what's happening. We have a roles variable. You know that the role uh, came out of the, the, the JWT. And as soon as an admin is there, we will bypass the cache. And uh, the end result of it all, and you'll see that on one of the next slides, is that I'm setting a custom header, X login. And X login is either true empty or false. And if it's true, we know the user has logged in and we can fetch that information from the JWT. So if we're trying to access the login page but you're already logged in, we're gonna redirect you to slash user. That is something we're not doing using rewrite rules because we can conserve a connection. Every web server connection we can conserve will do that. So this is just regular uh, expression, HT access, rewrite kind of stuff, but all done in Varnish. So we're matching URLs and redirecting crew so we don't have to consume one. Now, to be fair, you could uh, just do that using HT access or Nginx rewrite rules and cache the result. But I'm being careful, I'm being prudent here. The thing that really matters is in the bottom you're seeing return hash. 
So that means, and that, that is an instruction in Varnish, to force Varnish to cache, even if Varnish doesn't like what's happening. Because Varnish doesn't like cookies, but we're forcing Varnish to say, hey, we are going to cache this page. Then on the next slide, a lot of boilerplate stuff, but the top one is useful. Because a lot of people like using SSL. Who uses SSL or TLS on their website? Majority, right? Did you know that Varnish does not support TLS SSL? <laughs> Thanks for contributing. I like the interaction here. Great crowd, great crowd. So we need to terminate SSL before we enter Varnish. So we usually set up an HA proxy or a hitch or a pound or a Nginx or anything that can terminate that SSL certificate. But to avoid getting stuck in an infinite loop, we have to announce that there needs to be a cache variation for the exported proto header. Exported proto means that's a header being sent from the place where the SSL gets terminated, and that announces the, the protocol we're using. Because even if we're using HTTPS, the internal connection will be HTTP. And for Drupal, there will be no way to identify whether or not there should be a redirect to enforce HTTPS. So we should announce this and create cache variations. And meanwhile, you should deal with this in your code if you see an exported proto header. And it contains HTTPS that you render HTTPS-based URLs. We'll skip the rest and we'll just move forward. We're almost done here, right? Six minutes to go. Uh, we're gonna skip forward to the actual, the toughest part. And I don't expect you to understand this. Again, this <laughs> module is online and I'll share that VCL code too. What we're doing is reading the cookie. And we're using the cookie module to read the JWT cookie. And we call that the token. And then we do uh, regular expression magic. And you remember that there's three distinctive bits. Header, payload, signature. And that's what you're seeing in the first line. I've marked it in green. We're getting the first group with re regular expressions out of it. And that group is the header. And then we can fetch the type and the algorithm by doing uh, just find and replace action using regsup in Varnish. Regsup is, uh, is a sort of substitution method. And we fetch the data we need in the JSON object. Uh, I won't take the time to go over all the, the, the regex magic. It's, it's just too cumbersome. Next up, we're fetching the payload, second group. And what follows is, a, uh, is the signature. We get the signature, this is the third group. But what we're also doing is creating the expected signature so that we can match whether or not the data was tampered with. And we do that by using our digest library. Digest, uh, base64 URL, notepad, hex, yada, yada, yada. You take the key, you take the header, you take the payload, you chop it all together, and there's a, uh, a signature coming out. And then we could compare. And that's what we're doing next up. Uh, we're getting the payload, which is uh, received from the raw payload. We base64 decode it. It becomes JSON. We look for the expiration date. We look for the JTI, which is our Drupal session ID. We look for the user ID and raw information. And what ends up in these variables is just usable data. All of the garbage has been trimmed out. You have usable data that you can recycle to make certain decisions. Decisions being, if our user ID is not a number, Something went wrong, and we cannot say that the user is logged in. Or if the expiration date has passed, you're dealing with an expired token, so that user is not considered logged in. Or when the session cookie, the value of it, doesn't really match the JTI. Or when the signatures are forged, then you have a clever person trying to inject data to figure out some privilege escalation of some sort. But whenever all these conditions are met, the user is considered logged in. And here's a decision we're making. Uh, this will be replaced with whatever the pattern you're trying to match. Uh, for our client, those were the full episodes of the videos. In our case, it's node 2. If you want to access node 2 and you're not logged in, we're going to redirect you to the login page. It's a big decision to make. This is where it happens. You're going to access node 2, going to get redirected. Right? Final bit, because I've, uh, someone is going to cut me off. And nope. No, not yet. Uh, I've mentioned cache variations because that was the goal, right? To create a cache variation for logged in and anonymous users. And we've created all this VCL code and all this Drupal code to determine whether or not the user was logged in. And here's the final piece you need. Vary headers are powerful HTTP headers. I would advise you to use them. You can issue them in Drupal, and you can say vary on X login. Now, X login should be a valid request header, but since the browser is not sending it, but Varnish, we can throw the very header back and Varnish will create a nice cache item for that URL for the logged in user and a nice item 
for the anonymous user. And to finish it off, we need to talk a little bit about Drupal. This is DrupalCon, right? We need to talk just a bit of Drupal. Andreas, because it's not me who did it, Andreas uh, used some modules. He used the Varnish module, of course. He used the key model to store the JSON web token. Uh, he added the HTTP response headers and UI to set custom cache control headers on nodes, which is convenient because my, uh, my vision about Varnish is all about developer empowerment, so that means you as a developer, because I assume most of you are developers, should have control over the cache without having to write custom configurations. Agreed, there was lots of custom VCL, but the goal is when you use Varnish to have as few VCL as possible and use HTTP best practices whenever you can. Then we have yeah, the two modules, JWT cookie and that example stuff. And let me show you some screenshots. This is the homepage. That example, uh, because this is all, this is not something you'd use in production like that. He tr trimmed out all the custom stuff for the client and just made me a proof of concept. The JWT example cookie displays the timestamp and that's something convenient. If you refresh the page and the timestamp remains the same, you're using the cache. That's a, a trick I use for debugging. And he, he is reading the value of, uh, of the JSON web token and we're not logged in. But that's not really a problem because there's no real cache variation on that page. When I try clicking on the button to go to the logged in user only content to node two, I'm getting redirected to the user page. I'm not logged in. I log in and as soon as I'm logged in, I'm seeing the cached version and I'm seeing that I am actually logged in. It's a pretty stupid example, but I had to include it. And the behind the scenes, uh, I'm not gonna go through all the code, but he uses a composer package the El, the El Kobuki, or whatever you pronounce, the JWT library, and you can see all the fields he is setting here, and you can extend that if you want more data. So it's convenient. I would advise you, because it's Drupal 7, and this site is no longer online, it's now the Drupal 8 version, which was ba made by a, an agency who had caching in mind. It doesn't use that anymore, so this is very much usable in Drupal 8 land, but I wonder if you should do slight refactors. I guess you have to. So uh, hit me up if you have ideas to convert this to Drupal 8. And then in the end, he just sets the cookie using all that payload and validates everything. Uh, oh, I'm getting the signal, and that's okay by me because uh, I would like to thank Andreas again for creating that module for us and the client. You can download it there. Again, the idea is that you push session information from the server to the client using a technology like Varnish. If you wanna know more about Varnish, buy this book wherever you buy your books, right? Amazon, uh, wherever you get it, or as a subscription service with Safari books. Uh, I'm gonna raffle one of those away, so afterwards just hit me up on Twitter. I'll pick a random person. I'll ship you that book. Uh, all my presentations and the video footage of this will be listed on my website, as well as the slides. Uh, I'm available on Twitter, on Instagram, and oof, lots of pictures there. I would like to, and I'm gonna step here, I would like to thank you Uh, having these, having the data about which user is watching which videos and... Okay.